Good evening, class. I hope you're having a blessed day today. I am so excited to be with you as we're going into topic number 15. We're dealing with worship today. And this is probably one of my favorite lessons of the entire curriculum. Because worship is not just singing at church on a Sunday. Worship is so much deeper than just the songs that we sing. Now, there is an aspect of worship and praise in which we sing songs unto the Lord. But worship is far deeper than that. And worship of God and, and the way in which we worship God is so important. So today we're going to be talking about what is worship along with how to worship. And then we're going to look at examples in the Bible of worship unto God. And then we're going to really grow in our understanding of worship. Like as we did last week, we talked about prayer and we talked about prayer being directed discourse, whether we pray in tongues, pray with the spirit, or we pray with the understanding, we, meaning we pray in our known language, or we speak to the mountain, we command, we rebuke, we all of the different ways in which we pray, the way in which we exercise our voice in speaking either to God or to the mountain. It's kind of the two main ways in which we pray. But today we're going to be talking about worship. And worship is just such a, a fun lesson for me. And I pray that, you know, before you come to class, you really get into the Spirit. And you get into a, a reverence and a position to receive of the Lord. And what I mean by that is before I ever teach the Word of God, I, I worship God both in praise music where I'm praising and lifting God up and worship coming into reverence of the Lord and really coming into the spirit before I teach the word of God that mean the, that way that the spirit moves upon me and and teaches you everything that you need to know and if you realize that each time we teach this curriculum there's a greater emphasis on different points every time it's a different one it's you know sometimes it's that's the emphasis sometimes this is the emphasis and it changes based on the spirit of god and based on who's in the class not that the spirit of god changes but what i mean by that is that the spirit will move on me to emphasize a point greater for the people that are in the class each semester that's why we have more additional resources every single time we teach the class. That's why I encourage you, you know, you can always take this semester, but you can always go back and watch previous semesters also. So let's just pray. I want to jump right into the lesson today. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom revelation in the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, let's go into page 92 of the curriculum. 92. We're getting, we're getting through it and it's, uh, it's so exciting. But let's read this first passage. It said, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Now, this is an important point, and we don't have time to go into the entire context of John chapter 4, which is Jesus encountering the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, which I have taught before, and it is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible when it comes to like the greatest piece of revelation of doing the will of God. Like I said, we don't have time to go into that today. But that is a powerful chapter if you want to study it. What did Jesus call doing the uh, the meat? What what did Jesus call meat in John 4? Something to go and study. It's very interesting. It's meaning doing the will of the Father. But what did Jesus teach the woman about the Father? He taught the woman exactly what Peter received the revelation of in Acts 10 when he spoke to Cornelius, that the Father is no respecter of persons. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because... The Father wants them to worship in spirit 
and in truth. And in the spirit, there is no respect of persons, meaning that your outward appearance, male, female, 1550, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, none of that affects them that worship the Father. And that's why it's important to know the context of the story that Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman, somebody outside of the covenant. Yet Jesus is telling her there's coming a day when it's not the worship of the Father in the mountain or even at Jerusalem. It's they must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That's how we worship the Father, spirit and in truth. And it's the combination of the two that's so very important because there's a lot of people that get so far outside of the realm of the Bible when they talk about the spirit. Well, I'm doing this stuff and it's the will of God, yet it's contrary to the word and the truth of God. And then there's a lot of people that get so far outside of bounds when it comes to truth that there is no worship of spirit, meaning, well, this is this and this and that. Now, you need to have a 100% truth and a 100% spirit. It's both. It's the mix of the two. When I worship the Father, I worship him both in spirit and in truth, not one or the other, but both. You may well you may say, well, how do you, how does that matter? And 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 okay, let me let me give an example, the best way I can explain this. People will say, well, I'm worshiping God using this song, but this and and, it, and they're like the spirit just moves upon me, but yet the words of the song are contrary to the word of God. Then it's not spirit and truth. Spirit and truth is the way in which we worship God in awe and in reverence based on the truth of who God is and what God has done according to the word of God. And this is going to make more sense as we go, but it has to be in spirit and in truth. Now, does the place matter when it comes to worship? No. True worshipers is not about the place. And that's what I loved when Jesus said this. Because we say not at the mountain nor in Jerusalem. It's not about the place of worship. Because the body soon after, and that's the point Jesus is making, will become a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the minute your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God dwells inside of you, it's not about the place in which you worship. Now there is coming a day hereafter in which God will dwell with man and there will be no temple on the earth and you will worship God in spirit and in truth while he's on the earth. The Father will dwell with man in the book of the Revelation. And there's a day coming for that also. But the very first part is the way in which we worship God in spirit and in truth is based off of the fact that it is no longer going to be about where you worship. Meaning that you don't have to be at a church service on Sunday or a Wednesday night service to worship God. You can worship God in the car. You can worship God at your job. And, and, and worship, as we're going to see, is not just about the way in which we sing songs. Now, that's one of the main emphases of this lesson is worshiping God by the way we sing songs and praise God and get into a state of reverence. But worship is far greater than that because you worship God with your money when you pay tithes and offerings. You worship God when you serve others. It's all about the way in which we show reverence to God as the master. And as we do the will of God on the earth, which we'll get to in just a second, but it's not about the place. Now, a lot of people are like, I can't wait to get to church to worship. Well, you can worship God right now wherever you're at. And that's one of the glorious truths about the rebirth, about getting born again, is that you can worship the Father in spirit and in truth right now at your own house. Now, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, what is the temptation that, G that the devil is using against Jesus? Worship me, and I will give you all things. Now, this is a shortcut by passing the cross and subjecting himself under the authority of Satan. Now, here's something I want you to understand. When it comes to the lies and the deceptions of Satan, they are a lot more similar to truth than most people think. What I mean by that is in the Garden of Eden, 
when Satan told the when Satan deceived the woman, beguiled the woman, and he said, You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That wasn't the lie. The lie is that you'll not die. The same way when the devil tempts Jesus, the, the devil does have authority over the earth. He is the God of this world. So he could give Jesus the authority. But the lie or the deception in it is the bowing down and not going to the cross, which means you subject yourself to me. And I just like to make that point when we go through this passage because the lies and the deceptions, the seductions of the enemy are so much more similar to truth than most people think. You know, most people would say that the, the lie will be this easy to, to see. Worship God, go to heaven. And then the enemy's going to say, worship me and go to hell with me. Like, it's not, it's not like that. The lies of the enemy are so much more similar to truth than you may believe. That's why to worship God in spirit and in truth, you have to know the truth. You have to know the truth. Now, who are we supposed to worship? Worship the Lord thy God alone. That's what Jesus says. Get thee hence, Satan. Worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. No one else is supposed to receive worship. Now, this is where we need to make this point. The word worship is Strong's G, 4352, proskenia. It means to kiss the hand towards one in token of reverence. The same way a dog would kiss the master's hand or you would bow down in reverence and kiss the hand. The same way if there's a king sitting on the throne and you walk up to the king, you bow down and you kiss the hand of the king. That's what worship is about. The word worship does not say sing songs. The word worship does not mean cry in church when you feel the presence of God. The word worship is reverence as we bow down before the king and we show reverence in all, which means the word worship is not only dealing with the way in which we sing. Maybe, you know, the spirit of God hits you and you cry in church, you bow down, you lift your hands, you open your hands. And we're going to talk about some of those in, in a second, but it's mostly, it's actually what it is about is the way in which we show reverence and awe to God. Now, we show reverence to him by the way we cry out. We praise him for who he is and what he has done. Also, who he is and what he has done produces reverence and awe inside of us that he is our master. He is our Lord because he is and what he has done causes me to do. That's why I can worship God with my money, the way in which I give. If he is my provider... He has provided everything that I need for me. If I do believe that he is Jehovah Jireh, in reverence to him, I give. I don't give because I'm trying to get God to move. I'm giving because of who he is and what he has already done in my life. He already made provision available. He already spoke it before I had the need. All of those things made access available through the cross. And because of that, I worship. It's the way in which I show reverence and awe. The same way in which we cry out and we praise in church. All of it is worship. The way in which you stand for truth, even in the face of adversity, even under the face of martyrdom. These are ways in which we worship God. It's about the, the kissing of the hand. It's about the token of reverence. That's what worship is all about. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, what does Paul teach us about worship? We worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus for what he did on the cross. Having no confidence in the flesh. Now, confidence in the flesh would be what I've done giving me position before the Father or what I've done making my own way. That's called the law. It's not about anything that I do. It's about what he has already done. And Paul said, we are the circumcision. Now, he's not saying the circumcision because we are better than you. He's saying, no, we are covenant promises people, yet we don't worship God because of the promise. We worship God for who he is in spirit, and we worship God for what he has done in truth by Jesus. It's not about what we've done. I don't have confidence in the circumcision or my works making me right before God. It's who he is and what he's done that causes 
me to worship. It's all of you for all of me because all of you did everything that I couldn't do and it produces reverence back out of me in the way in which I serve the Lord. Next passage. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now where is this taking place? This is Revelation chapter 4. And I pray you take our end time curriculums where we go through this in a whole lot more detail and if you're following our daily teachings you'll know that we just we're in the middle of revelation but it says to worship the father it's taking place in the throne room of heaven revelation 4 revelation 5 is the throne room seen in heaven and it's worshiping the father son and the holy ghost specifically revelation 4 is worship of the father revelation 5 is the son now here's the question I don't think I've ever asked this during this curriculum, but with greater revelation coming to me as I teach end-time prophecy, I can expound the revelation inside of these curriculums. But one of the things that I want you to think about is how does the Lord, Genesis 1 God, God of eternity past, who already has all glory and honor and power, if he already has it, how does he receive it? How do you how does Genesis 1 God receive power? Doesn't isn't he already all powerful? Isn't he all glorious? How does he receive glory? I want you to think about that. If you read in Revelation chapter 5, the Son receives things also. Well, how do you receive it? Isn't it all yours already? Well, yes. But the way in which God receives glory and honor and power is from what God has given us, given back unto God. The Father gives the Son the earth, and the the Son then turns around and subjects it back unto the Father when the Father's throne comes to the earth. It's that dynamic of you gave me, and I turn around and give you back what you gave me. That's that dynamic of love and relationship that you gave it to me, but I want to turn it around and give it back to you. That's a powerful truth about how worship is dynamic between the Godhead, but also between man and the Godhead. How we worship the Father. Well, you gave it to me. I want to turn around and worship you with it back. God gave you your salvation freely. He gave you all grace and all faith. And I turn around and live my life in reverence to him and in worship to him by everything I do so he can turn around and receive glory that he bestowed on me back to him. I want to turn around and give it back. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, And of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Now, what did the angel say to John? Do not worship me. Worship God. Angels are fellow servants in worshiping God. Angels don't receive worship. Now, I don't think it's in the next passage. I believe I have it inside of the curriculum, but there's a place in which... um, Never mind, we're not going to go there at this second. I'm going to get way ahead of myself, and if it's not here, I'll have to take way too much time to explain it. But angels don't receive worship, but the Lord does. So if an angel appears to you, he won't receive worship unless it's demonic. Now, angels always turn around and give worship back to God. So we don't worship angels. A lot of people are like, they, they have these teachings and these books on angels, and you don't worship angels. Angels are with us as fellow servants unto the Lord. And we all worship God. God is the only one to receive worship. Now we, I'm going to go ahead and make this point. We know that the Antichrist and the devil's whole goal is to pervert people to worship him. You know, the, the Antichrist and the devil wants people to worship him instead of worshiping God. And that's the big, that's the big polar dynamics in the Bible is that God says nobody... You don't worship anything but me. And the devil wants to pervert people to worship him 
which will inevitably damn their soul to hell. Because God says nobody is to be worshipped but me. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant. Before thy people I will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou shalt see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And what do we learn about the character of God? He's jealous. Why is it important to know that? He will not accept or be okay with anything being put before him. You might say, well, how do I know if I put anything before the Lord? Well, Let's, let's just get, I, I've heard Bible teachers for years say this. My home pastor, when I first got saved, used to say this. And I think it's a pretty good gauge. It's not the only gauge, but this is one. Where do you spend your money and your time? Your money and your time is an indication of what you worship. What do you put as preeminent? What has first place in your life? Is it loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? And then loving your neighbor as yourself? Or it is your football team? Maybe it's your own family. Is it your job? Is it playing golf? What comes before the Lord? Where is your time and your money? Now, I'm not saying you can't play golf. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a good family. I'm not saying you can't watch football. What I'm saying is what is preeminent. Preeminent means first place. Predominant over. And you'll see that by your time and your money. You give $5 to the church, you spend $2,000 on football. Where it, Your time and your money is an indication of your heart. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And that's, that's just a gauge. I wasn't trying to go there today, but it, that's, that's the jealousness of God. God said, I will have nothing before me. You know, People ask me all the time about pets. I, personally, I believe having pets is ungodly. I don't think you should have, I don't, there's nothing wrong with animals, but I don't think you should have pets I, because pets are not eternal souls. The reason for that is people will take pets and value them to the same degree as people, eternal souls. And it's wrong. It's ungodly. It's sinful. Because God says the only thing that lasts for all of eternity is eternal souls, people. But yet there are a lot of people that will have pets they spend five thousand dollars on their dog, yet they won't give any money to missions. Your your heart shows that you have put in something else before God and the will of God. Whoever needed to hear that, I'm glad you got it, because that's not where I wanted to go today. But I, I pray that blesses you. That that should really stir your heart. Nothing comes before God. He's a jealous God. He will have nothing before him. And the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, what are the consequences of worship of another God? Tormented with fire and brimstone forever and ever. Now, I've never really qualified this passage, but I'm going to do it today. Them that receive the mark of the beast and worship the image of the beast, those that participate with the Antichrist in the generation in which the Lord returns, are already resolved. You know, taking the mark is not like somebody tattooing you while you're asleep and then, oh my gosh, I have the mark, I'm going to hell forever. That's wrong understanding. And I really don't have time to expound this today. That's why I encourage you to take our end time curriculum after you finish this class because it will give you a far greater teaching on that, on that specific subject. But the part I want you to understand is these are people that are resolved and saying, I will not worship the God of Israel. I will not worship Almighty God. I'm going to worship something else. These are people who have made the choice in their heart and they will never change. You know, it's it's being a part of the Antichrist worship system and taking the mark is not like, okay, I'm going to take it and then eventually I'll give it up and go back to worshiping God. No, 
These people are saying, I'm going to worship the Antichrist and I will never change. And those people never change. They're, they're resolved in sin. They're resolved in the worship of the devil. And because of that, I want you to understand their destination is the lake of fire, tormented forever and ever. That's the seriousness of the consequence. God will have nothing else worship before him. And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and there shall have no other gods before me. Thou shalt make not unto thee any graven image or any likeness of, of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, what do we learn about the first commandment? You shall not worship any God or place anything before Almighty God. It's the first and greatest commandment. Nothing is to come before God. Now, how serious is about how how serious is God about this? It's not secondary. This is primary importance. God repeats Himself multiple times to reinforce the message. God says something once; it's important. If God says it three, four, five times in a row, He's telling you this is the seriousness of this statement. Iniquity can reign from the third to the fourth generation. God will show mercy unto them that love Him. Now, this is a point in which I need to make a lot of people like, well, these are the passages where people get this idea of generational curses. Well, if you are born again, you're redeemed and delivered from the curse. Generational curses do not affect them that are born again. When you get born again, you get the rebirth. The Spirit of God comes inside of you. The curse is broken off of your life. There's no longer generational curses on you. Generational curses reign down the line of them that are disobedient to the Lord. But if somebody will say, hey, I'm going back to the Lord, the curse is broken off of their life. That's why in the Old Testament you see, well, this person did evil, this person did evil, this person did evil. And then somebody pops up and says, I'm turning back to the Lord. And they go back to worshiping the God of Israel and the curse is broken and the, the, the blessing of God is on their life again. The curse is only upon them that do not worship God, and that's through choice. <clears throat> now let's read some Psalms. We're going to talk about some Psalms about how to worship God. Now these are just a couple examples of how you worship. Because you know you go you go into certain churches and denominations, and you know it's it's pretty stoic, it's real reverence, but there, there's no movement. And they're like, oh, them Pentecostals or them people that got the Holy Ghost or this or that, and and they say, well, that's not biblical. Well, let's talk about it. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto the unto God with a voice of triumph. What two things are mentioned here? Clapping and shouting. You ready for this? Is it a request? No. God tells us how he must be worshipped. You know, it, you, you might say, well, I don't like doing that. Well, God says, if you're going to worship me, you worship me the way I want to be worshipped. So if he says clap and shout, you know what we do? We clap and shout. I worship God the way God wants to be worshipped. You want to know why? Because God already did everything he was going to do for me, and I didn't deserve it, yet he did it anyway. So if if you did, if that's who you are, and that's what you did for me, and you say, hey, I want you to clap and shout, guess what? I'm going to clap and shout because that's how you want it. I want to give it to you that way because what you gave me, I mean, how little of an act is it to clap my hands and shout unto the Lord in triumph and praising him, yet he sent his son to die for me? I mean, you did that, I can definitely do this. Very, very simple. But I just want you to see these things that are, they're biblical. Clapping and shouting, guess what? They're biblical. And that's how God wants to be worshipped. That's what he tells us to do when worshipping him. Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord that made heaven and earth, bless thee out of Zion. Now, what does this tell us about worship? We're supposed to worship all times of the day, day and night. You know, I, I like to stand before the Lord in the night. 
You know, when I go to Kansas City and I go to IHOP and I go to the prayer room, I'm usually there in the night. I like to worship God in the day and I like to worship God at night. All throughout the day, the Lord deserves worship and I want to be a part of that. Lift up your hands. Bless the Lord. A lot of people get into church and they do this. They just hold their hands here and they do this little rocking motion. God says, lift your hands. So I'm going to lift my hands and I'm going to praise the Lord. We say, well, why do you do that? He sent Jesus to redeem me. And he says, I want you to lift your hands. Boom, hands up. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to lift my hands unto the Lord. You know, if, if, if your spouse says, hey, I want you to love me in this way. I'm meaning, hey, will you, when I get home from work, will you give me a hug? You know what you're going to, well, of course I want to do that for you. That's how you want me to show you love? Then I want to do that for you. This is how God wants to be worshipped, so that's what I want to do for him. But not only is he not asking, he's telling. It's not a request. Lift your hands up. God tells us how he wants to be worshipped. But as for me, I will come into the house of I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Now, what does it mean to worship? To enter into the mercy of God. That's through Jesus, through what Jesus did. This is why I come. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the help of time and need. Does it say you come to the throne of grace and timidness and fear? No, come boldly boldly to the throne of grace let all the earth fear the lord let all the inhabitants of the world stand in the awe of him when it talks about fearing god it's not talking about fear as in scared it's talking about fear as in reverence how big you are and how small i am yet you want it listen god is genesis one the genesis one god creator of heavens and earth yet he says i want your worship you want me to lift my hands, to shout, to, like you want, like my little things, they, they don't seem to matter to me, but you want them? Well, if you want them, I want to do them because you want them. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. How are we supposed to live our lives? By the faith of the Son of God. We are crucified with Christ. This is an aspect of worship. I live my life is the way Christ did. And I live by his connection to the Father. We talked about that in our, our, our talks on grace and faith. But if Christ laid down his will to do the will of the Father as an aspect of worship, so do I. Now, next part. Let's talk about this. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children cried in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said, Have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? Now hold that thought. Read Psalm 8. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength. Because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now, Jesus was quoting Psalm 8, yet he changed it a little bit. But he didn't change it. He actually expounded the revelation. He connected the fact that perfected praise, meaning worshiping God for who he is and what he has done, is the exact same thing as ordaining strength. Perfected praise is what steals the enemy and the avenger. Now, I'm not saying perfect praise. I've, I've quoted this verse before to people because this is what Jesus said on the Passion Week leading to the cross when they cried out Hosanna to the Son of David. And people would say, well, I don't have perfect praise because some, maybe my tone isn't right, maybe my pitch isn't right. Maybe I'm not a worship leader. Well, guess what? Your pastor isn't a worship leader. Either. Like, I don't think I'm a worship leader. Granted, I love to praise the Lord. I've had people before say, Cody, you, 
you shouldn't be on the stage singing. That ain't your calling. Well, I agree. I don't think it's my calling either. I've also been in a in a in a in a meeting before in a, my own aisle, praising at the back of the room, the Lord, and a lady turn around to me and say, "Every time I hear you open your mouth and praise, the Spirit of God hits me." So I've had both encounters. Here's the point. I don't care what you think about my praise. Because God's not looking for perfect praise. He's looking for perfected praise. Well, what's the difference between perfect praise and perfected praise? Perfect praise is the best pitch, the best sound, get all the words right. That's perfect praise. I'm not talking about perfect praise. I'm talking about perfected praise. Perfected praise means the same way they cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. They were crying out in worship for who he is and what he has and will do. That's what they did. That is what Jesus called perfected praise. So when I worship God in church and I sing and I praise him, it's not about how my voice sounds. It's about what I'm saying because of who he is and what he has done. That's why I worship. That is what Jesus calls perfected praise. But when he takes that word in perfected praise in Psalm 8, perfected praise was called ordaining of strength. So when I praise God for who he is and what he has done, that is what ordains strength. That's what builds strength on the inside of me. I tell people, I look at me, they say, well, I was just having a rough day and I cut on some worship music and then all of a sudden I'm built up, I'm strong, I'm ready. Of course, because when you worship God for who he is and what he's done, perfected praise, that is what ordains strength. So if you're in a moment where you're feeling low and you're having a rough day, I tell people, cut the worship on, start praising God for who he is and what he's done. And it will ordain strength. It will literally build you up and bring strength onto you. You start to gain momentum. You'll bring forth strength. You'll start to feel empowered. It's not because of you, because you're worshiping him for who he is and what he has done. But it also does two things. It stills the enemy. Well, the enemy is the attack that you're facing right now. The lies, the temptations, the attacks of the enemy right now. But the avenger, the fact that it stills the avenger. You know what the avenger was in the Old Testament? The avenger was the person that was coming after you because of something you've done before. So it's talking about not only am I stealing the attack of the enemy now, meaning the temptation, the lie, the deception, the shame, the guilt right now, but it's also stealing the, stealing, stopping the avenger for something I've done previous. Maybe you made a mistake and there's consequences of that mistake coming onto you still from something previous or shame or guilt for former things. You did it a year ago, but it's still following you today. God says, if you will worship me for who I am and what I've done, he goes, I will still that. not And still, meaning I will stop it in its tracks. I will stop that attack of the enemy against your life. The enemy has no place and cannot stand when a person worships God. That's the, the, when, the when you start to worship God and the presence of God comes in, Every life, both now and former, are stopped in their tracks. They have no place over you. It's one of the greatest parts that Jesus ever said. Well, how do we worship God differently now? Well, we worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to give a little short understanding real fast of something else, and then we're going to finish. The Bible talks about the fact that we cry out, are the four beasts and the elders cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The four beasts that stand before the throne of God. That's what they cry out every day. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And when they do that, they're worshiping God all day. And when they say holy, meaning holy other than, greater set apart. But I want you to know when they cry out, Holy, 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 they are worshiping God for who he is and what he has done when he also, in the context, is sitting on the throne. Sitting on the throne meaning God is about to execute judgment. Also in Revelation chapter 19, 
when they cry out alleluia or the word in the new king james is hallelujah that word hallelujah is used four times in the bible all four times it's used is in revelation chapter 19 and you know why the people the saints cry out hallelujah the people that are on the sea of glass cry out hallelujah lord god omnipotent reigning you ready for this is in the context of god judging the great whore and bringing forth the vile judgments against the against the antichrist and his kingdom the word hallelujah is in context to god's judgments and the righteousness of the fact that god will judge all sin all iniquity and remove everything that hinders love it's the song of moses you know what the song of moses is it's exodus chapter 15 where they go through the red sea in 14 god kills pharaoh and his army and Exodus 14, and then Exodus 15, you see Miriam grab a tambourine and start smacking it and dancing and worshiping the God of Israel for what he has just done by the deliverance. Who he is, almighty, all-powerful, what he's done, deliverance. In the context of God executing the fierceness of his wrath and his judgments against Everything that hinders love, all sin, all iniquity, all ungodliness, and God bringing forth justice and avengement over your life, that's worship. A lot of people think that the judgments of God are a contradiction to God's character, yet the judgments of God are actually a manifestation of who God is to remove everything out of our lives that hinder love and all sin and all ungodliness, everything that the enemy does in our life is stopped in the presence of worship and praise. And there is a response to God's judgments. And I know that's kind of a little, a little extra today, and it's a little, uh, it's a little too far down the line. Like I said, I've got other curriculums that go into this in way more detail. But I want you to see it today, because worship isn't just. We worship God for he's glorious and Jesus died on the cross. We worship God for he's glorious. Jesus died on the cross. He brought reconciliation. He executes the fierceness of his wrath. He brings forth judgment. All of these things go together. Because God's character is not just love and peace and goodwill. It's love and peace and goodwill that is brought forth because of judgment. And we thank God for everything that he did because he judged the devil. He judged the great harlot. He judged all iniquity and sin. He removed it out of our life. And we praise him for everything that he has done and will do and is currently doing. And when we praise God for who he is and what he has done, it brings strength in our life and it stops the enemy in his track. That's why we worship God day and night. And we clap and we shout and we lift our hands and we worship God for exactly the way he wants to be worshipped. Because nothing deserves worship outside of the Lord. Jesus and the Father is the only one to receive our worship. And we thank God for that. I pray this lesson has blessed you. I'm going to throw some uh, some additional stuff in the resources today, so please make sure you go online and get that. But Father, bless these people in Jesus' name. I give you all the glory. Amen and amen. If you're in the class and you have questions, please make sure you send your questions in. And if you're not already in the class and you're like, man, I need to get this curriculum so I can get enrolled and get even more information on this, then go online to our website. When you buy the curriculum, it'll auto-enroll you in the class. Please make sure you're subscribed. Please make sure you like. Please make sure you share this with all your friends. But class, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day. And we will see you next week as we talk about kingdom finance. But class, I love you and have a great day today.